Nigeria is among the 30 high TB burden countries due to limited access to TB screening and testing services. But with support from USAID, the National TB Programme, the Stop TB Partnership and Aligned Stakeholders, Bashir Ahmad, a local radiographer, is able to set up and run systematic rapid screenings in Nigeria's most remote areas. He is on the front line, saving lives, cycling to hard-to-reach communities using the ultra-portable digital X-ray system and computer-aided detection or AI software. It's my responsibility to take the examination in terms of positioning the fashion. Then we'll collect his samples. And cut for TB is really helping because Actually, it can detect TB at early stage. That's the first one. And secondly, the heat map can show you the fatches around the chest. If there's any fatches, you'll see it with your eyes. It's my town, my community, my people. So it's a dream. So I want to give back to them by helping them or by doing this work. It's my passion. I want to follow my passion. Good morning, everybody. We are going to start with a webinar about transforming the search for TB in Latin America. So we are going to see the power of the, of the portable X-rays and the artificial intelligence. I'm going to give you some instructions right now. When it comes to the use of cameras, microphones, and the questions and answers. This webinar, is being interpreted in English. If you want to listen to Spanish or English, please click on the interpretation option and choose the language you prefer. For the questions and answers, please use the chat. We are going to pay attention to the questions that you write there. Now, if we continue with the agenda, we are going to present the speakers that we have today. We have da da Daniela Puma. Sorry, I mean, we have Guido Geertz. He's the founder and CEO of Delft Imaging. We also have Joao Pedro Neves. He's the business developer. We have also the program the program coordinator in Peru. And we have from Colombia Dr. Karin Betancourt. She is a re representative of the Santander TB and Hansen program in Colombia. We also have from Paraguay, Angelica Medina. She is the head of monitoring and evaluation of the NTP. And she's also a consultant of the WHO for epidemiological review tuberculosis. We also have Florent Gertz, who is the business unit the director of Delft Imaging. Next, we are going to explain the in interpretation as I explained earlier. So you have to click on the option below that says interpretation and you have to choose English or Spanish. Now we are going to hear the welcoming words for Guido. Thank you. 
Good day, everybody around the world. Um, my name is Guido Geerts. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Delft Imaging. I'm very sorry I cannot introduce myself and the company in Spanish. Uh, uh, so I hope the translator will do a good job. Uh, my colleague, João, of course, he will do it in Spanish uh, and the rest of the speakers as well. So for the, all our speakers today, a warm welcome. Thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Uh, being a, uh, almost a senior myself, I always get the easy job, and that's uh, the introduction of the company uh, and the history. Uh, so as you see below on the logos, uh, Delft Imaging is part of the Million Lives Collective. That means we have impact on more than million, a million people who are living on five and a half dollars a day. We are also uh, a B Corp. Uh, and actually, uh, last year, we uh, uh, were uh, mentioned that we were on the top 5% of B Corp corporations and it means uh, a social enterprise that focuses on impact so we're not an NGO uh, but for us impact is the most important part of the company uh, nobody is funding us so we have to be profitable but we are focusing on impact next uh, slide please so our focus has always been on uh, screening of tuberculosis so here you see some uh, images uh, starting from actually the factory of our uh, original mother company. So already in the 50s of the former century, we were screening tuberculosis. We were uh, an X-ray manufacturer, still are. Uh, and you here see uh, the production of analog Odelkas. So most of these Odelkas, these analog X-rays, uh, went into smaller clinics or in these old fans, as you can see in the middle uh, of the picture. And then we had doctors looking at this image. So this way, um, we, we actually had mass screening. We were actively trying to find TB. And this was still the case until about the 70s of the former century. And then we eradicated TB in the Western world. Somehow in um, the 80s, the WHO recommended not to use X-ray anymore, most probably because we're not enough doctors in some less developed uh, uh, countries. And um, most of the screening went with uh, sputum analysis. So when actually I started almost 25 years ago, uh, I was surprised that there was still uh, 1.5 million, 1.7 at that time, people dying of tuberculosis uh, because we were not confronted with this in the Western world again. And uh, we were focusing on this, trying to see if we could solve the problem of not having a doctor because that concept, mass screening, X-ray uh, with a doctor, that worked perfectly well. So already almost 20 years ago, we invested a lot in uh, machine learning Nowadays, we're talking about artificial intelligence, but at that time, uh, the, this word artificial intelligence was not very common. Uh, and we invested uh, a lot of time and money on this development. Is it possible to mimic the doctor, to actually, uh, instead of a doctor, use a computer program uh, to analyze the image? So, And this is actually one of the things I always mention if we say, what, what does it mean being an impact company? So we, for years and years, trying to developing this and try to convince the market that this was the way to go. Normally, if you would only be a for-profit company, you would have stopped after a couple of years. Uh, but we were fully convinced that this was actually uh, a very important development. Fortunately, uh, about two years ago, uh, the WHO endorsed uh, the, uh, what we now what we call Cat for TB. That's actually our branded uh, product uh, as a very important tool. Uh, and uh, so this is actually what I always say: this is having impact. And so the Cat for TB, the artificial intelligence, was one of the issues we one of the tools we developed. 
one of the other tools is what you can see on the left. I think this is Paraguay. On the right is, was uh, probably Peru, but was what uh, what we call uh, uh, the portable X-ray. So uh, I think it's on the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So it's a Delft light, light backpack X-ray. Because what we saw in in the field when we were doing all our projects is that it was not always um, an X-ray you needed in a stationary clinic or an X-ray in a van. Sometimes you needed to go by boat or a very remote area. So we, we developed this concept of what we call a backpack X-ray. So you can carry the X-ray on your back. Uh, and for us, very important as well uh, to have all our systems being able to, uh, uh, to have solar panels. Uh, so not, not to use diesel generators or these kind of developments. I think this slides is uh, one I'm uh, trying to uh, focus on as well, is that it's nowadays not anymore about uh, the algorithm uh, or just the, the hardware. It's the total solution that is uh, important. So uh, how does the hardware work with the software? Uh, how is the installation organized? The training should be there, the support, and this total solution uh, that is what we are focusing on. And that can be totally different in the different environments. So this is when we start a project, one of the first things we discuss with the customer. Uh, I hoped to have a, an image here, but my colleague uh, Joao will eventually show this as I think a, a great example of how innovative sometimes we uh, do these projects. It was a project in Nigeria where they, uh, instead of a, a large truck that we supplied years before, they wanted to have a, a smaller system uh, for in big cities. And then we developed what we call uh, wheels on KK, uh, actually a very small tuk-tuk type of um, uh, uh, mobile, um, uh, mobile car uh, with a backpack X-ray on board. And that's now functioning uh, in, in the large uh, Nigerian cities. And this was specifically developed for this project. I think that's uh, some something that I'm very proud of. That nowadays we have such a huge amount of uh, knowledge about X-ray and software that we can just specifically for your project uh, develop this. Uh, maybe next slide. So, this is a slide just to show the experience we have. So uh, again, since the 50s of the former century, already on uh, TB. And to be honest, uh, normally as a company, you would be proud that you have such a, uh, a long uh, experience. But actually, it's a very sad thing. Uh, if you talk about TB, how is it possible that after so many years, we still are not able to eradicate TB? So the, our real mission is before 2030, together with your help and all the experience we're going to share also today to really uh, eradicate TB. There are much too much issues in the world and we can focus on a lot of them. So I really uh, would appreciate it if together we could uh, eradicate tuberculosis. And just to show them what we have done till now on the right side, it's the cumulative uh, numbers. We are more than 70 countries uh, 1,800 installations, and eventually have impacted now more than 20 million people that we screened on tuberculosis. These are the, not just numbers. Uh, so if you go to the website, you can see all the projects. Uh, so under projects, you can look in all the projects all over the world, what we do have done and how we did it. Um, and there's also an impact report if you're interested. So, we, so what was the impact that we uh, that we generated? And maybe as a last thing to also show what it means to do uh, to have impact is that we deliberately never uh, made patents uh, on our developments, not on a cat for TB. We wanted actually that our solution would be copied very quickly. So everything is open. All the research that we've done, you can find on the, on the internet as well. And fortunately, nowadays, we have a lot of 
suppliers who can supply something similar. And that's the thing what we try to stimulate and also today be open on uh, the developments, be open what we accomplish so that we can learn very quickly and, and eradicate TB in the coming years. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and then now my colleague, Joao, will do his presentation in Spanish. Thank you very much. Hola a todos, buenos días. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is jo Joao Pedro Neves, and I am the business development manager for the Latin America and for the Latin American region. I'm going to present now after Guido a little bit about our portfolio of products and how we support TV programs around the world. Next slide, please. Okay, our portfolio, we work with three types of equipment. The first one is the stationary equipment. As you can see on the left of the screen, we have the ECDR, Compass DR. We have also the containerized clinic. This could be maybe near a hospital, a clinic. or this can be a clinic itself. Then we have mobile equipment. As you can see in the picture, we have Mac M1, and we also have the One Stop TV mobile clinic. This is basically a clinic in a container, but it's at the same time in a truck. So of course, this can go to places that are far away. And then we have the equipment that it's portable, Ultra, and we have the backpack and the Delft Ultra handle, handheld. The main difference between these different types of equipment is how portable they are. And the amount of scans and screenings that you can do per day. Of course, the more portable the device is, less is going to be, smaller is going to be the amount of screenings that can be done. In our portfolio, we have all of the types of equipment and the TV program, which is the investigation that we are doing on the TV. We have, of course, the possibility of using the equipment that works the best for that specific program. Next. In the portfolio, we do not only work with X-ray options, we also have AI software, and we work with this offline as well. You can use this online, offline. It depends on the internet connection you have. In the software, we also have the platform, the CAT4 TV platform, where you can have the data, to support the program, the decision making. So you can decide where to put an equipment, if it's necessary to move it to another area, another region maybe. And finally, to complement our portfolio, we have the service and the support. So this means that we have trainings that can be online or on site. We also have a platform for learning. This is for the constant learning of our users, of, of our equipment, of our technologies. And then we also have the maintenance service of the equipment, the software. All of this that I just explained, all of this is available through different catalogs. As you can see below, we have the PFSCM, and also the catalog from the UN and the Stop TV Partnership. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to talk about the 
value pr proposition of Delft. We have an integrated and holistic approach. So it's not that we only pay attention to the digital X rays. We work, we look at this, at this as a complete thing. It's we also have artificial intelligence, we have the training, we have the support, maintenance, we have everything all working together so that the TV programs can have all of the tools from just one provider. We want to offer a complete solution so we can re reduce the amount of TB cases and we can reach key populations. Next slide, please. Okay, this is how we su support TB programs. We do this by having digital optimized X-ray equipment and also with AI CAT4 TB. We also work with other uh, diseases. It's not just about TB. And also we have digital TB d data management. So all of this is part of our portfolio. And you can see that we work with solutions that are innovative and complete. For example, we can have a direct um, X-ray equipment in Nigeria, let's say. Next slide, please. And then we support TV programs with services, as we said, with trainings, with maintenance support. And we guarantee that the program the government has has a total cost of ownership so that so that they can know the full price of this before buying the software and the product and the equipment so that there are not any surprises in the future for any extra cost of maintenance or anything that has to do with those things. We also have programs. We also have the prices for the guarantee for everything. As I said, the idea is that these numbers are clear and not hidden. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Now we're going to move on to the presentations from different countries. Thank you so much for listening. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. We are going to continue then. Now I am going to present myself. I am Karen. I am a manager of the here I am working today as m m in this call in the webinar and I just want to to talk a little bit about the partners in the health area before talking about this I want to talk about our headquarters and we are present in 10 countries and we've been here for 21 years strengthening health in many countries in Peru, we have been working there for 26 years. We all should have the right to have medical assistance, but for millions of people in Peru, this is not the case. With your support, we can provide health to the poorest places in the world by working together with local entities to help them. The approach we have is a companion. We work with our allies and colleagues in the community and local authorities with different levels of nation entities so we can help and improve health services. How can we guarantee health? We have different strategies like strengthening support working with the creation and strengthening of community agents in the health area. We believe all human lives are 
very important and all of them should have the same opportunities. That's why we try to close breaches in health matters. We work to prove that health quality is a universal right. We want to show social injustice and we want to stop the, the breaches that we have in that aspect. We work with the Ministry of Health. We work with networks of health, local entities, public, private as well. And we are working with the society itself. We guarantee health through our professionals who provide, in many cases, assistance in the addresses of the people. We also work with different programs. One of them is the TB program, where we apply, where we have an active search. Through our program for TB, we focus on identifying TB and fighting against TB. It's variables with a so social approach and through, through new technologies and investigation is always coordinated with the communities and societies. We have some priorities and we work strengthening the capability in health institutions so they can provide an understanding solution for the detection and treatment of TB. We also have many interventions and investigations when it comes to TB that help to contribute the knowledge necessary to develop strategies and effective treatments that we are applying. We also work on advocating for TB. We help society to participate more in actions in favor of people who suffer from TB. Finally, we've also worked on sequels, on side effects as well from TB, and we try to develop strategies for people who have finished with the treatment for TB, but still have some medical problems that need medical care. Within our projects, we have three main ones. One is the active search for TB cases. My colleague is going to explain this a little bit more. She's just going to talk more about this program with TB this is a strategy that we've been applying for many years now with support of tech technology, of course. We also work closing the gaps that we have in this disease, working with the country and trying to strengthen the different aspects that have to do with training, treatment and prevention of TB. We also work with society so we can end TB by strengthening the actions of people in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we can provide an understanding solution for TB through education, public policies with an approach of human rights. So to sum up, those are all of the activities that we've been working on from Socios Sin Salud in the TB program. Now I would like to present the next speaker. The title of this presentation is Active Search for Importance and Experience in Peru. Right now, the speaker is going to be Mrs. Puma, who is a program coordinator in Peru for TV. Go on. Good morning. 
Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me so I can talk about my experience in Peru. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are focused on taking medicine to the people who need it the, the most. This image that you are seeing now shows this. This is our way to battle TB through our strategy, which is a backpack TB that I'm going to show you in the presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, Peru is in South America, as you can see in the map. Sadly, we have a very high amount of people with TB. We are talking about 123 people every 100,000 people. And most of them are cases from MDR TB. So as you can see, we have a large amount of resistant TB. So from the people who suffer these disease, 61% of them are males and 66% of them are between the ages of 15 and 44. I guess this is a number that also is very similar to other countries in the region. It's not just for Peru. Next slide. Thank you. Okay. We've been working, as I said, in all of the country, Peru, but we started working in Lima, in the north of the city. This is where we started our active search. As Karin explained, we've been working on this for more than 20 years. And this TB rate has been consistent in those years. Sadly, we haven't seen a decrease in this number. We haven't either seen an increase in the number, except for COVID season, of course, where, where we had more problems. But I'm sure all of you are aware of that. So this made us think about how can we improve this? It's not that we don't have TB cases. Um, we just think that the strategy back then was saturated. That's why we decided that we needed new strategies with the, using technologies so we can identify the cases at an early stage and we can start with the treatment. Next slide, please. Our strategies, well, we actually have two. We have TV backpack and TV mo mobile. We started with this in three areas in Lima. This one, these areas in total had more than 1 million people back in 2018 when we started this. And we used our digital X-ray equipment using AI from CAT4 TV. This allowed us to have a strong al algorithm and this can help us to do the, the treatments. As you can see, we have worked with other partners that are both from the country and also from the areas. Next slide, please. Okay, so we already know that the WHO in 2020 created this guideline on TB, right? So, as I explained before, we started in 2018 and we didn't have these type of gu guidelines before. So this has been very useful for us to increase the activity that we have now. As you can see, the screening test is a step 
as well. And it's a recommended step when we talk about the X-ray, maybe not as a diagnosis at first, but yes, to have a fast screening to check who might have TB or not. Next slide, please. Here we have another study that was also very, very, very good for us so we can understand about the strategy. This study was done in v Vietnam and it was showing in the same way, in the different ways of screening somebody on TV, what was the best way. As you can see, doing an X-ray, chest X-ray, was one of the best options. Next slide, please. For activity, we need, well, first, we need to get the community involved, right? Because we depend on them. This helps us to reach more people and, and also make them think that there is not a stigma when doing a screening, right? Because it's important, it's a disease that anybody can have, although it has a negative um, re a negative impact, let's say, on people. So we just had some posters, we talk about the disease, we had some songs about this, we worked a lot with leaders in the community, with people that had already su suffered from TB, Here are just some pictures of examples of what we did. Next slide, please. The steps for our screening, well, the steps for the algorithm are two actually. The first step is the screening, right? So for us, every person in the place that we go to well, we only go to places where there is a lot of cases of, of t TB, right? There are specific social factors that may allow or may contribute to this large amount of TB in that area. So for us, any person that spends time in that place is a potential TB person. It's, it's a potential person with TB. So that's why the first screening we have, well, it's just asking them some questions, talking to them, then doing a chest x-ray with cat 4 tb as you can see in the picture and then we get a result from 0 to 99 and we can know if the scope it's more than 50 this means that this person needs to have an extra step needs, needs to be seen again Next slide, please. These are some pictures in our mobile unit. As you can see, this is the equipment that we use, that we have been uh, using in the last couple of years. Here we have the technicians looking at the X-ray. We have a heat map that allows us to visualize where is the affected area in the lungs. Next slide, please. And then step number two, as I mentioned in the first step, the person, well, most of them don't even have symptoms, right? For us, just anybody that works in that area can, can be somebody who has TB, right? So when they move to the next steps, we do an diagnosis ev evaluation. And this is a more difficult aspect because sometimes people don't want to give us a sputum sample for expert. So we need to do some counseling, we need to talk about them, and we try to do it. Once we have the sample, we analyze this, we do a clinical evaluation of everybody 
And then we have the diagnosis whether that person has TB or not. The people who have TB, we support them. We create a community agenda so that the entity in the area can provide the support and the help needed until the end of the of the treatment, right? Because that is the main goal, right? Not only ending the disease, but also starting with the treatment. Next slide, please. Here, just to remember the criteria that we have in the diagnostic and why this is important, we have a ra radiology cr criteria, clinical one as well, laboratory as well. These are the three things that we take into account to identify the TB cases. This is a very good way to find an early stage of the disease. Next slide, please. So these are the results from the first year. We were able to screen 58,000 people. As you can see in the picture, there are so many people waiting to get tested and like to get the screen. And of course, not everybody spends enough time waiting in line to actually get the screening, right? So we can say that from all of that amount of people, 28% had a, an abnormal result. We had people that were children, elderly as well. And then from the experts, 2% were positive, 14% had a uh, re re resistance to rifa rifampicin. And we have to say that 20% of the people of the people who were positive for TB had a test in the past that was negative. But then the specific screening for this was positive. That that's why as you can see, 83% of these people started the treatment within the three weeks. We have two indicators that are very useful in these active search st strategies that this is the number of people that should be screened. So at first, we had this number that every 100 and 150 people that we ev ev evaluated, only one had TB. Next slide, please. Then here we have the trends in the cases of TB that have to do with age and sex. As you can see, the bars help us to know the amount of people. It shows that we screen more people, more women than men, actually. But the lines tell us the people who actually have TB. So we had more male people with TB, despite we screened more women than men. So this is why we say that this is a disease that affects mainly men. So this helped us to adjust the strategies that we had with the community engagement because we needed to engage more men, right? And that's where that's where screening on workplaces, mainly for men, became very important, or just areas in particular that were that where more men were present, actually. Maybe a factory or uh, gas stations, areas where there, there, there were only men, as I said. Next slide, please. And then these are the challenges that we have when we started the treatment. As you can see, we had these problems or these challenges because 
Peru, we already had some teams that worked on this, but this wasn't really known by every health institution in the area. So something that helped us a lot was that the Ministry of Health got their own equipments and started to share them with institutions. Another problem we had was that sometimes the trace re result is difficult because we are unsure if we have to start with the diagnosis. Well, it depends on the case as well. And finally, the cases that are detected, but not with a doctor. I mean, this was a problem at first as well, but we were able to improve this as years went, went by, but these are basically the challenges that we faced on the first year. Next slide, please. Here we have the different type of screenings that we have. We have the TV mobile and the backpack TV. As you can see in the first image, there is uh, like a device for electricity, so it doesn't need power, like it's uh, like an automated power. And then we have the backpack. As you can see, you can go to very, to distances or places that are otherwise hard to access. Next slide, please. Here we have the advantages and the, and the, the disadvantages on this. As you can see, the truck can transport all of the material, all of the equipment inside, like that's a very good aspect of it, right? But the disadvantage is that, of course, this is a larger investment and it's difficult to access some areas with this truck, right? And with the backpack, it's super easy because it's just something that anybody can carry and you can take it anywhere, basically. Also, the radiation is smaller as well, but the problem is that we cannot print the screenings. And of course, it also needs electricity. Next slide, please. And then just to finish, over the years, well, right now we are in 2023, so we've had many experience with different types of people and Yes. And here we have a table, a chart, with the different types of population. As you can see, we have the trans transgender people who have around 29% um, of abnormal X-ray. Then we also have pop, uh, people who live with HIV. Here we have, let's say, all of the numbers, all of the people that we have studied over these last years. And then something else that we have done is we analyzed people who live around specific areas, right? Poor areas where they have higher number of TB. And also migrant people even though it's not a very large amount of people, it's still a significant amount of people who suffer from TB. Okay, next slide, please. These are some pictures of the activities that we have done. Next slide, please. And then I want to invite you to please watch this on Netflix. This is the, the story about us. I think it's going to be only this week on Netflix. So if you can and you want, please take a look at it. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you for your time, for the presentation. Okay, now we are going to move on to the next speaker. We are now here with Karine Betancourt. She's representative 
of the program in Colombia and the title of her presentation is Active TV Search Experience in Santander, Colombia. Good morning, everybody. Hello, I'm in Colombia. As you can see in the screen, I'm Karin. I'm a doctor and I am part of the TV program. I want to thank you for inviting me to this to this conversation so I can just show a little bit about the project that we have about active TV search in Colombia. Okay, the first slide, thank you. Uh, okay, so the project that we have in Santander aims at the prevention of TB. Next slide, please. Okay, so that you can have a context or an idea of how TB is in Colombia. In the fifth place, we have the area where I am. <clears throat> During the last couple of years, we've always been in the top five when it comes to the larger amount of people with TB. We also have to keep in mind that the areas around us also have a very large number of TB. And also Venezuela right next to us has a lot of cases of TB. Next slide, please. Okay, if we look at this in districts at a national aspect, Santander has two districts, two areas with the highest amount of TB in the top 25 of the national areas. Then we have another place in Position number six, we have Bucaramanga, who also is having an increase in the numbers of TB. For us, it's very important to be aware of the amount of cases because this can tell us, this can show us where we need to strengthen the the search for diagnosis in that in those areas. So we've been strengthening community activities over the last three years getting organizations involved, and we had we have, of course, partners, facilitators, and people who work with us, helping us to support the people who suffer from TB. In number 22, we have Barranca Bermeja, and so you can have this information like in a clear way. We have two areas in the nation and we are the fifth area with the highest amount of TB. And then in the top 25, we have two cities, two areas that also have the highest amount of people with TB. Next slide, please. Okay, something important to mention here is that in Colombia, we are analyzing the data from 2020. And there are some technologies that already existed back then, but were not very popular back then. So we started working on this and doing a follow up. So we can guarantee that the technologies are being used. When it comes to the pulmonary TB cases, from 2020, we had 85% of 
pulmonary cases. And then right now, that number it's 90 10 that means we have a higher amount of cases pulmonary cases so this is increasing the transmission that's why it's so important to guarantee a diagnosis on time and a treatment so we can end with this transmission chain in the next image we have the cases diagnosed by new technologies. I say new technologies because we started using them in 2020. But of course, these were developed in the past, right? Before that, we have molecular tests. Santander had a team expert on this. And then we also have liquid culture culture and basiloscopy, which is something that we all know. And unfortunately, or not, in some places, this is the only technology that they have available so they can have a, diagnos a diagnosis. If we take a look at this, when we started, basiloscopy was the main way to identify the cases, but as years went by, with the follow-up and the support and everything from the team, we are able now to show that the molecular test provides a large number of cases that allow us to have a diagnosis on time and can show us a resistance or not. So we can adjust the diagnose and the strategy. Next slide, please. When it comes to the incidence rate in Santander, the green line re re shows all of the different ways of TB, right? Of, of the city. And then the red line shows the cases in the country. So as you can see, the place where we are is way above the country's level. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, this is something that motivates me and makes me extremely happy, is to show you the experience that we had with our mobile TV. You are going to see that, well, as everybody, we had a lot of challenges, a lot of problems, but this taught us a lot of things so that in this new year that we are starting with using this again, we don't make the same mistakes or we don't have the same errors that we had in the past. So the prevention and control actions in Colombia and also the health aspect, Santander began, co be began co cooperation with the NGO Socios en Salud Peru as a beneficiary entity of the Global Fund for Fight Against AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, financing, planning, management, and execution of the project, prevention of TB in the Department of Santander through the strategy of mobile X-ray units for active search for TB cases. Next slide, please. The regulations are, well, as I mentioned in the past, we have the resolution number 227 from 2020, which adopts the technical and operational gu guidelines of the PNPCT. We have also a, st a strategic plan towards the end of TB 2016-2025. This was 
taken into account for the planning of this project. We have here some images of the publications and actually the advertisement that was spread around in the in the different cities. Next slide, please. Now we have the coordination. So when we started with the network and the different EAPBs that operate in the in the department establish those responsible for the execution of the different actions established within its TB care route for the processing of molecular tests and the treatment of participants who present an alternation in the radiographic plate. Even though we do this coordination and we had work teams in many areas, we were able to notice some that some r routes are not working, are, are not doing what they should. They are right on paper, but when we were on the field, we saw that this was not really working and people were being affected by this. So this is something that if we wouldn't have worked on this project, we wouldn't have been able to identify this, to see these barriers, these challenges that we face and that we need to remove so we can diagnose as the regulation says. Next slide, please. Execution. This project was carried out in 11, in 11 municipalities prioritized by the Departmental Health Secretary through the cooperation of the construction of social and community human sense. This is a community organization that has experience working with people who suffer from TB and AIDS. As I told you, 11 areas were prioritized where we took into account how many people were suffering from TB, how many people were re re resistant and the amount of deceased. The pictures here show a vulnerable type of people that of course were the first ones to be screened and the first one to be taken care of. We prioritized prisons, and this was actually a plus because we were able to articulate with another entity the access of the X-ray equipment and the access that provided the service or the attention for these activities. Next slide, please. Okay, here we have the project phases. We planned something, of course, but unfortunately we had an endless amount of problems, challenges, and we were able to, to solve some of them in a fast way, others took a little bit longer, but this made us adjust our chronograms, like our schedules, right? So in February and March, we had articulation of agreements and organizations of the project. Then in April, May, we work on the structure of the process. In June, July, we worked on the education and awareness of TB together with a very large team of professionals, technicians, and community agents that of course play a significant role in the search, diagnose, and support of people who suffer from TB. In August, we had 
screenings, but one of the challenges that we had made us made us have intramural screenings only. And then November, sub September, with the rest of the team, we were able to develop activities extra. I mean, this was our main goal, right? Right To have screenings that are not just intramural, but it's actually outside of that so we can reach the community and vulnerable areas. In November, we had the results of the screenings. We worked on that. And unfortunately, we finished with the project and we were unable to guarantee like follow up to the samples or to the total amount of images that seemed or that looked abnormal. So this was another challenge we faced. And this year, the new activity that we planned from the program contemplated all of this, right? So we don't make the same mistake and we run out of data. Next slide, please. Okay. Then we had the very important day for us. That was the day where we launched our project for TV mobile. We have Daniela here. Uh, I wanted to thank her once again and all of her team. So we had a very large event in a very typical area of the city. And in this day, in this event, we also had a training provided. We already had the license of the mobile equipment in the name of ESE. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to look at the pictures, as I told you. This is in Barranca Bermeja, which is number 22 in the areas with the largest amount of TB at a national aspect. And we had an event on awareness and education on TB. Then the operational team carried out the search assessment and sampling according to the EAPV route of users with altered scores. Next slide, please. Then we have the execution of the screening day. Here we have some pictures of these screening days in the key spaces prioritized by the program. So we prioritize areas like Chiron, Pie de Cuesta, and these are part of the metropolitan area. We also have Matanza, Puerto Parra, San Gil, Socorro, Cimitarra, and Sabana de Torres. We also had screening days in wellness centers for the elderly. You can see some pictures here. We are talking about elderly people, maybe with disabilities as well, and also in community centers to support street dwellers. Next slide, please. Karen, you have one minute and we need to finish. Yes, of course. Okay. Here we have, as I mentioned, the areas where we worked. Next slide, please. When it comes to the results we had in September, 
we had a problem with the equipment. That's why the numbers are quite low. Next slide. Here we have the screening results. We can see that the altered ones, we try to establish the root of the treatment. Next slide, please. I'm not going to explain this because uh, we already talked about this, the route of, of the study. So next slide, please. Well, I already explained this, but this is the active search path and how we have all of the aspects covered, the community involvement, the participation, the screening, the referral of people with TB. Next slide, please. Here we have the results for the altered patients and the not altered patients. As I explained before, we couldn't guarantee that follow up, let's say, of the of all of the people who had altered x-rays. This was one of the weak aspects that we had. So we really hope not to make the same mistake in the next project. We really hope that we can get a real number ever since its beginning until its end. Next slide, please. And then as I told you, for this year, because we want to keep on using the X-ray and the CAT4 TB, we prioritized new activities that is to provide information to strengthen um, to strengthen the areas that are more relevant. We are going to work on three provinces. In the technical team, we have a medical, we have uh, nurses, assistants, and community managers. I really hope that in the future, I can get to show you the results. We already did the presentation of the project. We had the awareness events. And tomorrow we are going to start working on the screening, the X-ray screening tomorrow. On Saturday, we are going to be in Barranca Vermella. So I really hope I can get to share some really positive news and to carry on using this equipment and help people with TB. And also so we can guarantee a treatment and end with a transmission chain in a better way. Okay, next slide. Thank you. That's it. I'm finished. Thank you so much for letting me share this with you. Thank you, Karin. Thank you for your presentation. Now we are going to move on to the next speaker. We are here with Angelica from Paraguay. She's the head of monitoring and evaluation of the NTP and consultant for WHO, Bay, BAHO for Epidemiological Review TV. So Angelica, please go on. You have 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Now I'm going to talk about the innovation on public health, the role of AI in the detection of uh, TB in Paraguay. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
Okay, so for you to have a context, Paraguay is in South America, and according to the last numbers that we got from 2020, we actually got this information three weeks ago, Paraguay has a population of 6 million inhabitants, and we can see here the cases of TB in Paraguay From 2000 to 2022, we can see how this number increased. Right now, it is believed that there are 3,500 cases. And these are the numbers, as I said, for this year. Next slide, please. OK, when it comes to the incidence rate for TB, we can show here that 48 is the amount of people with TB every 100,000 inhabitants. And in 2022, used to be 43.6. You can see how the bridge is closing starting from year 2015. In 2020, there is a drop, of course, in the number that has to do with the pandemic for COVID. And then we see how this number begins to increase again in 2021 and 2022 is one of the highest numbers in the last years. Next slide. This slide shows the information from the OMS. This is the draft for the TB profile in Paraguay. We are going to be able to see these in the global TV re re report from the OMS in the future, we can see that the incidence, which is this green light, we can see. And then you can see a black line, which is part from Paraguay. So as you can see, in 2020, the bridge is almost closed. And then the difference that there is between this slide and the previous slide. The, the, the difference is that the OMS uses the estimated population from the UN when we actually use the estimated po po uh, amount of people, inhabitants from national entities. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So you can see the distribution of the cases in Paraguay. On the left side, we have the map that you can get from our expert system, that it's the online system that we have to identify all of the TB cases in Paraguay. On the left, you can see Paraguay's map with the cases of TB. And on the right, we see the Paraguay map with the incidence cla classified by very high or low. So as you can see in the Chaco area, which is Paraguay and these areas in dark blue, the areas, the cases there are quite high. The, the incidence is very high. You can see that in the other map, there are not many cases on that area, but the reason why the incidence is high is because there's not a lot of population there. So that's why. So the incidence is higher, even though the inhabitants is lower. This is where we have the larger amount of indigenous people. Next slide, please. This graphic, I would like to show you how the detection of cases increases. These are the blue bars. When we started using the gene expert chart, the fast tests that Paraguay has implemented as a first diagnosis. So every case that could be TB is offered this fast test. And we've been doing so since the end of 2021. So you can see in the picture how the number of cases increases 
in the last couple of years. Next slide. Next slide. Now we're going to see the characteristics of TB cases in 2022. We can say that 70% of all of the cases were bacteriologically confirmed. And then 81% of these cases were new. We have 99% of the cases that are considered sensitive. And Paraguay has many, has not a lot of cases that are re resistant. And last year, we've only had 20 cases. So this is also taking into account that we have already implemented the gene expert as a diagnose. When it comes to the location of TB, 92% is pulmonary. Next slide. If we talk about TB and the problems it had in 2022, 10% of all of the TB cases, it's this means 3,500 cases, 10% of them were people who had HIV. 7% was people with diabetes. Next slide, please. Then when it comes to the risk population with TB in Paraguay, 12% of all of the cases happened in indigenous people. And as you can see, we have people also who suffer from um, addictions uh, of smoke, other types of addictions as well, and people who live on the streets. Next slide, please. The characteristics of the population with TB in Paraguay when it comes to uh, female and male. As it happens in everywhere else in the world, TB is a disease that mainly affects men. And in the ages of 15 and 40. Next slide. These are some pictures of our populations. I mean, we already talked about this, right? We're talking about the people who live in jails and indigenous people. These are pictures from the prisons. Next slide, please. And then to keep in mind, according to the regional re report of the Pan-American Association of Health for 2020, we have a list of countries according to the amount of TB they have in people in prison. So as you can see, Paraguay was in number six with an amount with a number of 2,400 cases every 100,000 inhabitants. This was for 2020. Next slide. Here we can also see according to the case de de detection activities in uh, prisons, we can see how the number of TB increases. And also our activities of looking for respiratory uh, symptoms. You can see that this number increases. Next slide, please. So you can see the difference between the incidence that we have in people in prison, that is the blue line, like the, the one at the top, compared to the numbers in people who are not in prison, that is the light blue line, you can see the very large breach that there is between these two types of people and how this is a problem for Paraguay. As you can see, we closed 2022 with a total amount of 3,700 cases of people with TB in prisons 
and 43.6 people in um, cases of people who are not in prison. Next slide. And then to talk about the X-ray with the use of AI, it's very important to say that this is very useful because in areas where the tools and the, the resources are not many, we know that the conventional X-ray has limitations. And we also have the possibility of va variability in the in the resources. So we also know that sometimes we don't even have access to people who can use these devices in some areas. So that's why AI automates and standardizes interpretation and complements healthcare workers. Also, the promise of CAD technology is to be useful with ultra portable X-ray systems that extends detection to hard to reach populations. Next slide, please. And then according to the NTB strategy, we have three main pillars. One of them is precisely about the intensification of the research and innovation. This is where we're talking about the use of X-rays with AI for the detection of TB at an early stage. Next slide, please. And then the WHO recommends the use of CAT for screening and triage. Next slide, please. Then in 2022, the WHO re recommended the use of CAD software programs for everything that has to do with the detection of TB in early stages. Next slide, please. And then also to strengthen uh, the efficiency of diagnosis with the aid of digital x-ray with AI. This helps us to have uh, an early de detection. This gives us precise images. And we can also identify other types of problems that have to do with the lungs and the thorax. And also, it provides accessibility. Next slide, please. And then we have Paraguay's experience. Here we have to say that from 2016 to 2021, Paraguay has been working in the active search of cases, which was done according to the clinic. So from September 2021, we started a project called Prinos. This project is led by EUSAC. It's an organization that is made of people from Portugal, Spain, and Paraguay. And this project was focused on Paraguay's prisons, especially the ones in the capital and in the center of the country. With this project, we reached more than 3,800 people who were tested for TB, and we used the digital X-ray with AI. Now, from May 2022, Paraguay started its experiences with um, X-rays, Digitals, and then in January this year, Paraguay started using screenings with digital X rays through Delft equipment. Next slide, please. 
Now for you to see the circuit sequence for active searches. This is very similar to what has already been mentioned by the colleagues in Peru and Colombia. This is the algorithm that was also applied in Paraguay. And for this, we did coordinations with the team together with regional people in charge to go to those communities that were far away and maybe people also who were in prisons and indigenous people. So as I mentioned, we had to do some coordination with local teams. We talked to the people and invited them to participate in these activities. And with the circuit, the first th thing we did was interviewing people to get their information. And after that, we presented the digital X-ray, what are the benefits, and asked them if they wanted to participate in that experience. Once they accepted, we had a score of 60 to be able to go to this Putum sample. So we can confirm or not a TB. And then in other cases, whether it was necessary to have samples and even though the X-ray showed everything was okay. Next slide, please. These are some pictures of how the team prepares to do the x-rays, how they look, how the images look. Next slide, please. And then these are the objectives that we had in this active search. That, that is to implement an active search strategy and capture of presumptive TB cases through the use of digital X-rays with artificial intelligence. We reached five health regions using this Delft equipment. We focused on key population and also in those places with a high number of TB. The team is made up mainly of people in the national program for the control of TB. Generally, they go to sanitary regions, to places that are far away, and there are two we have two people, it's a group of three or four usually. Sometimes where we can, we also bring a doctor and we coordinate this in the region so we can reach places that are very far away and that need a, of our assistance. Next slide, please. Then to talk about some of the results, as I mentioned, we start to use the Delft equipment this year, actually in January. So we're still working on this on our database, right? And we want to adjust our database and do an analysis and, and share our experience. Then from January, to July, we were able to test 500 and around 500 people. 101 had symptoms, 89 were examiners, and in total, there well there were 12 cases with TB. Next slide, please. If we talk about key people, population, we talk about the people in prison, indigenous, TB contact, people who suffer from that diabetes, and people with history of previous 
treatment. In indigenous people, we analyzed 82 people. Sorry, we analyzed 288 people. 82 had uh, some type of abnormal abnormally in the x-ray and we confirmed five cases. In contacts, we've analyzed 37 people, seven had no problems in the x-rays and there were two confirmed TB cases. People who suffer from diabetes, we tested 39. Six of them had normal x-rays and we had four confirmed TB cases. We also saw people who suffered from TB before in the past, 20 of them were screened, seven had no problems and two were confirmed cases of TB. Next slide. And then for our next steps, the TB program acquire a TB mobile and it's ready to be used. So we are going to be using this that apart from the X-rays, it's going to have a gene experts so we can make sure that the case for TB is positive or not. Next slide. And then just finish with this, Paraguay has many challenges, of course, when it comes to TB, because we no longer have funds for this, for the TB. So we are working with the funds from the Ministry of Health only. And one of the challenges we have is this, the, the budget. We don't have enough money for it, all of the logistics of the TV. So we just need to make sure the maintenance, like maintenance of the equipment. We need to prioritize our efforts, strengthen, strengthen healthcare. And we need to use x-rays and consolidate the screening tests on prisons. Thank you so much. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you, Angelica, for sharing your experience with Paraguay. So now we are going to move on to Florent Geert. He's the business unit director of Delft Imaging. He's going to talk about CAT4 TB in practice, real world applications in TB programs for impact. Go on, Florent. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And thank you, everybody, again, for joining our webinar uh, today. We're going a bit uh, over time, but the good part is I'll keep my part as short as possible so we can still do a little bit of Q&A. And of course, it's uh, the most important part is that our speakers were able to, uh, to tell their story and their experience, which we're very thankful for. I'll keep my part uh, short. If you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, just to briefly mention, we'll send this to you. By the way, I saw some questions on uh, can we get the presentations or the recording afterwards. The recording will be shared with everybody who registered. You'll definitely receive that. We'll also share this document about cat for tb in practice. It contains a lot of information. We talked a lot, of course, about cat for tb and artificial intelligence today. This document has a lot of information on the relevant guidelines and policies, uh, but also about the deployment of it, you know, economic impact, uh, how do we do training and support, different user cases, and so on. So we will share that with you. I don't want to spend too much time on that right now, but we will share that with you afterwards. Next slide, please. Yeah, so it's just some highlights. So um, I think it's good for everybody to know that the, the scientific validation is incredibly important, I think, in the development of artificial intelligence solutions. So we've been working on CAT4DB already for over 20 years in terms of research and working with different partners around the world uh, that have published about their experience in the software in a variety of different settings. So we put a couple of recent publications here uh, about the utilization of uh, cat for tb So we have here integrated screening and testing for TB and COVID, where cat for tb uh, and cat for covid were used, uh, but also how cat for tb was used, for example, in mass screening in uh, prisons. Uh, 
So I won't go into detail into the publications now, but after the webinar, we will also share that you can see the URL here, they're on our website, but we will share with you the full publication list so that you can also go through that. It's a whole library, so you can also uh, sort that by region. So if you're interested in what else has been done across Latin America uh, with the software, then uh, you can see that also in that publication overview. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I want to particularly talk about, uh, do a little bit of time with the Q&A. Again, I apologize for going a bit over time and I appreciate everybody still. So what I wanted to do is to go through the Q&A a, a little bit with you. Um, so I saw a question uh, that was actually the first one that came in, uh, whether there's a portable x-ray is already in use in some countries in uh, Africa. Uh, yeah, definitely, but uh, I think globally. So there's about 400 uh, Delft lights, uh, portable x-rays all across the world. There is about uh, close to a thousand cat TB installations across the world. Um, we will share, we've just updated actually our, our project pages on the website where you can share all of the, see all of the projects and also those you can sort by regions. If you want to know where Delft Light has been used, whether it's in Africa or, or LATAM, uh, you can review more about that. Um, we won't have time for all of the questions, but what we always do is that we'll do as much as we can today with different speakers. And then we will reach out to the different speakers and make sure that we answer all of the questions and you will receive the full Q&A sheet afterwards. So I'm just going to pick a couple of questions for us to cover. Um, my first question, I would like to ask this to uh, Dr. Daniela. Um, Dr. Daniela, there was a question, is there a significant radiation hazard when you use uh, portable X-ray systems in open place? And how are you managing this? Yes, thank you for the question. When it comes to the mobile unit, it has um, plomo around it, so we have a license for it. Of course, it went under a quality control when it comes to that aspect. So, of course, it went through tests and everything to make sure that it's safe to use. When it comes to the portile equipment, we have a license to use it. And these can be used in the places where the mobile unit cannot go. And the recommendation we have is to have uh, a large area. It has to be six meters long around. Please bear in mind that the radiation from this type of equipment is, of course, much smaller than the ones from other type of devices. But still, of course, we make sure that we use the equipment six meters away from anything else. Yes, perfect. Thank you, uh, Dr. Daniela. Indeed, the radiation exposure from these uh, new types of uh, systems in general is very low. I know that the Stop TB partnership with others is also uh, researching this currently, so I'm sure there will be a publication about this out soon. I also wanted to add that we also provide guidance on our site and do training on how to work with radiation and how to mitigate radiation risk in the case of these portable systems, because that's, of course, a very important component uh, of it. Um, there was another question from Valentina, I think it was for you also, uh, Dr. Daniela. Uh, I think it was twofold. So the one version was, I saw you already answered it, but I also wanted to ask it live for the group. Um, which version of cat for tb were you using and how did you calibrate the threshold for it? Yes, we started with the version six and we still use that one. The calibration is very useful. We send some x-rays so we can calibrate that. And something that we have to keep into account is that we need to assess this according to the amount of resource we have. Because maybe if I don't have a lot of expert, 
And then for the Ministry of Health, they are using the version 7, which is, of course, a newer one than the one that we are using. They have also done the calibration, and, and that's the, the CAT4 that they are using. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Daniela. And then there was a question, I think multiple ones, and I'd like to ask both uh, Dr. Angelica and uh, Dr. Karin uh, to, for their perspective on this. How did you approach this type of project in relation to the indigenous populations in your countries? Were there any specific considerations? I don't know, perhaps if Angelica, yeah, I see that you've just unmuted yourself. Thank you. Sí, justamente una de yes. las razones claves que tenemos así como presentamos. One of the key things that we have in mind is this type of people, right? In indigenous people. So that's why we focus on these, on them through the digital X ray with AI. So this is our target people for everything that has to do with the use of digital x-ray and for the screening. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Angelica. And uh, another question, let's see, also for uh, Dr. Daniela. Um, did you use AI for the, the artificial intelligence for abnormal TB or was there still human reading involved? We use AI for all of the X-rays. We use CAT for TB for all of them. Very, uh, very good. I think that's the approach that we see the the most uh, indeed. Actually, that all of the X-rays are effectively also read by the artificial intelligence software, and then that most cases uh, uh, within that the abnormal cases are followed up with uh, bacteriological uh, testing. Um, maybe this is also good point and we'll we'll send it to everybody who registered today uh, afterwards as well but also on our website under projects and client stories you can find all of the uh, different webinar recordings um, so this is the first time actually we've done a Latin America webinar which is great but we have stories over there from uh, across the world and their utilization of these kind of tools so if you're interested in learning more about it and how other programs globally are uh, working on TB screening with these kind of tools you can also have a look uh, there. Um, I think with this, I'd like to uh, conclude. Uh, I think we've already gone over time uh, 20 minutes. I'm very happy if a lot of people still stayed on. Uh, again, if I haven't answered all of the questions yet, I will uh, get back to it in the Q&A sheet, which will send, be sent uh, afterwards. Um, I don't know, Karen, or whether you wanted to do the, the any closing, or shall I do it from our side? Yes, it's okay. then I'll do it from my side. So again, I very much want to thank the different speakers for uh, for being here today and for joining us. Uh, their time and their insights, I think they're incredibly valuable for, uh, for everybody in the group. I think it also shows by uh, the very large amount of participants we had today, which is very great. So we're very grateful for their time and also thankful for everybody who attended it for spending your time with our webinar today. We do hope it was uh, it was insightful. Um, again, we will share the Q&A sheet afterwards. We will share the recording, the cat b document I mentioned, um, and also our full uh, publication uh, list. So, yeah, and uh, maybe also good to mention, we uh, uh, have these kind of webinars uh, at least on a quarterly basis, also with clients and partners from us, like all over the world, uh, like partners like uh, Socios on Salute uh, also helped to, to host this webinar uh, with us today. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a, we'll also send the link if you're interested in keeping track of future webinars, we'll send that link to everybody who registered as well. 
So for now, I wish everybody a good day. Thank you again for uh, joining. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.